Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to UCC. I'm Ben, the young adults leader here, and Raja is gone this week and next, but luckily uh, he's put me in charge for just the next two weeks, and we'll be continuing our Roman series. After that, we'll be back to Corinthians, so just hold on a little bit. Um, so I know a lot of you weren't here for the first Romans 12, 1 sermon I gave, um, and that was a few weeks ago. So I'm going to recap a little bit of that now so that we're ready to move on. We had set the stage of the Roman culture in that time period, and um, the letter that was written uh, had talked about what the Roman church was like. Uh, Rome at the time was the center of the world with the highest level of culture, ideas, money, and power. There was a significant divide between the rich and the poor, and everyone was trying to make a name for themselves. There was incredible depravity in the city, with every vice imaginable being available at a moment's notice. There was a saturation of religion in the city, with temples to every imaginable deity and daily rituals and sacrifices. The citizens of Rome were constantly busy with fitting in, either seeking approval from their fellow man or from their deities. In the middle of all of this lay this fresh, new Roman church. This church was a primarily Gentile church, which was a bit weird, um, and this was actually because Emperor Claudius had kicked out all of the Jews from Rome, because there had been this um, conflict, this great conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles over who Jesus really was, and his solution to that was just kicking them out. Eventually, they, the Jews all returned to the city, but by this point, um, the church was very divided and was mostly Gentiles. So with this division, um, Paul wrote into that, uh, with many of the themes of Romans tying directly into it. He had this goal of providing a united and more complete look at the eternal plan of God for the salvation of sinners. With Christ always at the center. The first 11 chapters of Romans are so full of deep theological truths. From the evil nature of all of humanity, to the purpose of the Old Testament laws, to... Uh, Christ's final sacrifice. Paul ends chapter 11 talking about God's great plan, his sovereignty, and all of his great mercies and gifts that he's given to us. This all builds towards the practical instruction in chapter 12. Last time was all about verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We do this sacrifice because of the mercies of God. Because of the first 11 chapters, all of this solid foundation of theology gives us the ability to act, to sacrifice. We saw this quote from John MacArthur. Well, I think I skipped over it last time, but here it is now. Um, your orthopraxy is a direct reflection of your orthodoxy. Your ethical behavior is a direct reflection of your dogma. Your duties flow out of your doctrine. It's what you believe that essentially designs your behavior. There is no basis for right behavior except right doctrine. We then looked at what a real sacrifice is. It's surrendering something valuable for hope of God's favor. A sacrifice can't be an afterthought. It has to have real significant value. It's giving away something good for something great. And... Sacrifices must be made in the right state of mind, and they should be part of our daily lives. All, all of the people in the Roman church would have understood this between their two cultures of sacrifice. So then we looked at how Paul tied in the ideas of slavery to sacrifice. Um, offering your bodies as a living sacrifice is willfully choosing slavery. It's giving up any control you have. It's giving up your dreams, your desires, and even your loved ones. It's putting those items on the altar and accepting their death. There is a balance, though. While we are his slaves, he has shown us the grace of considering us his sons and daughters. Being a slave does not mean fearfully obeying. It means obeying out of reverence for all that he has done for us, all of the mercies of God. The purpose of both these analogies, the slavery, the sacrifice, and the sons and daughters, um, are serve a purpose. They're, they're tied together for a reason. And it's to show the absolute ownership God has of us while matching it with the utter belonging we have in him. He is a gentle and loving dad. So our rational service, our living sacrifice, is serving the Lord in everything we do, as if we are doing it only for him. 
and no one else. God wants every action, every moment to belong to him. So even if you're doing something for someone else, he is still taking ownership of that moment, of that action. It's him that rewards, that supplies, and sustains. Every moment is his, every talent is his, and every penny is already his. Being a living sacrifice is just recognizing the reality of our relationship with God. So that was last time, and with that context, here's the next verse. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The previous verse was all about the body, bodies. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And now this one is all about the mind. It's, it's be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Both our mind and our bodies are key to the themes of Romans. Being devoted in thought and action are essential. They're imperative. We had learned last time about what exactly the world was according to Rome. And the center of that world was Rome itself, um, according to Paul. Um, f- filled with every vice, every distraction, and every deity imaginable. It was this culture of self-satisfaction. There's God's ideal for us, and then there's everything else. That everything else is the world. Those that don't submit to God, those that don't offer their bodies as a living sacrifice, are the world. It's so easy to find our home in the world, to seek belonging, to try and fit in. It feels good. It feels natural. It feels easy. When we make our lives about ourselves, whatever detracts from that enjoyment is done away with, and anything that enriches us is captured. It's all about self-magnification. The problem with self-magnification is, if there's just a little bit of bad, it becomes a whole lot of bad. And what do we know about ourselves? There's more than just a little bit of bad. We are greedy. We are lustful. We're arrogant, we're prideful, we literally come up with new kinds of evil. And we're surrounded by a world that does as well. Evil is all around us. Well, maybe you're one of those people that finds it easy to be around evil without becoming infected by it. You might say, it doesn't bother me. My friends are obscene, but I'm not. Or, I don't feel convicted about watching this show. I'm not affected by seeing those things. Well. Two things. One, you're wrong. (laughs) Two, that's not the point. You're wrong. It does drastically affect you. You may not notice it at first, but our minds are designed in such a way that repeated exposure and being around people that do things changes our views towards those things. But that's not even the point. More importantly, we are actively distancing ourselves from God when we do these things. James 4.4 4 says this, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. When we don't treat the influences of the world as evil, we risk becoming an enemy of God. Paul talks about this pathway earlier in Romans as, one, as, as well. Romans 1, 24. Here it is. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. This is scary. It continues to get more explicit after that. And by opening the door to the world, we are running the risk of being handed over to evil, to be given over to our shameful desires. You know, John actually talks about this as well, so why not go to that too? Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, The lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So I'm not saying that we need to live in a little bubble and only interact with Christians, that we have to give up all of our worldly tech and all trendy things. 
That's not necessarily our calling. There's a difference between enduring the world and loving it, and there's also a big difference between trendy and worldly. There was a period of time in church history where there was a, a, a big hubbub about introducing new instruments. Rock bands had emerged on the scene that used drums, and now they started being introduced into churches. Drums! Terrifying. There were huge preachers that would talk about how evil drums are in the church. They saw some evil people using something and assumed the item took on the evil qualities of that person. I'm here to tell you, drums are not inherently evil. Otherwise, a lot of worship in the Bible would have been satanic. They used drums. In the same way that last time we talked about how music can't produce worship, drums can't produce evil. It can be an, a vehicle for good or bad, I guess, but by itself, it's just a drum. Christian communities are really, really great at finding things to call worldly and getting carried away with it. From movie theaters to women wearing pants to Dungeons and Dragons, all of these things were seen as having some evil in them somehow, and so they must be completely bad. Luckily, none of those things are evil by themselves. Yet, you can absolutely sin while taking part in any of them. Yeah, you can go to the movies and not be in love with the world. But you can also go to the movies and watch something that influences you to become more accepting of the evils in the world. You can dress in some new trend, whether that's pants or something maybe a bit more modern, and not be sinning. Like, it's, it's not that big of a problem. But you can also dress in a way that provokes lust. There's definitely fashion trends that make life a little bit more difficult for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's not ideal. And games. You can play games, whether that's Dungeons and Dragons or Ticket to Ride, and absolutely not be living in sin, being conformed to the patterns of this world. But if every single time you play Monopoly, you get so angry, you just want to flip the whole board over, it's probably not a very edifying activity for you. We may not always notice when a trend brings us closer to the ways of the world or not. So when we think about trendy things or worldly things or things that we aren't really sure of, the question to ask is not, does it bother me? That's not really important. Instead, we need to ask, does it bother God? Are we distancing ourselves from God's desires? If so, then we need to be extremely careful because he may just distance himself from us. Then, after that, we can ask, does it bother believers? Are we causing our brothers and sisters in Christ to stumble? Are our lax attitudes to the world rubbing off on Christians who may not have our experience, our foundation, or understanding? And then if both of those questions are answered with no, only then can we even consider asking, does it bother me? Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Peer pressure and the ideas of conforming to those around us have been studied extensively. We're mimickers, um, often to the point of mockery. I have been, I have this like little annoying tick, I guess, where I unconsciously mimic laughter. If I hear somebody in a crowd make like a, a, a guffaw or a little laugh, so often I'll unconsciously try to make the exact same sound. And in public, Kendra gets really annoyed at me when I do that, so I'm working on it. But it just, it comes natural to parrot, to mimic. We will copy someone's mannerisms, their style of speak, their fashion choices, their interests, their decisions. Everything that you do is so heavily influenced by those around you, whether you realize it or not. One study was set up with two participants taking a 10-minute test of some sort or another. Um, the test wasn't important because it was actually a distraction for the two people to interact together. One participant was actually in on the whole test the whole time. They were this inside man. And the other person was unexpecting. Unsuspecting? Yeah. The inside man was assigned to regularly rub his face throughout the test or to just tap his leg. The participants who weren't in on it were drastically more likely to do that specific action, to parrot that, than somebody who wasn't exposed to that specific thing. We unconsciously need to fit in, even in the small things. There was another study, a uh, similar concept, two people, one of them's in on the whole thing and the other's not. 
And um, for this one, the undercover participant was either instructed to mimic the body language of the other person or to not mimic at all and just be fully neutral in body language. After the test or whatever it was, the two participants were told to rank each other on likability, how well they got along with them, and things like that. And if they had a mimicker, they rated that person very highly. And if they didn't, it was much more neutral. But not only do we love to mimic, we love when people mimic us. It makes us feel comfortable. It makes us feel seen, heard, whatever. All of that stuff. There are a lot of different reasons why we would mimic, why we would conform or parrot. And most of them fall into two specific categories. One, to fit in socially. And two, to survive in a situation where we don't have all the information. I used to be a roofer. Um, and when I was a roofer, on my first few weeks, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know how to do anything, and even swinging a hammer was a little questionable. Um, so I copied out of self-preservation. I got the type of shoes that they had. I walked on the roof the same way that they did, and I tried to swing my hammer the same way that they did. And if they had started to do a little fancy spin when they got out of the car every day, I would have copied that. I don't know what keeps me safe. Um, <laughs> When you don't know what keeps you safe, you copy out of self-preservation. And then the social aspect is also key. Fitting in with a group majority is so important to us, to our individual survival, that we will quickly compromise on facts that we're confident in just to fit in. There's many studies about this, um, but um, there was one that found that if you're in a group of as small as four people, if they disagree with you on something that you know is objectively wrong, in certain circumstances, you'll change your mind. You'll agree with them, even though you know it's objectively wrong, almost 30% of the time. Like, that's crazy. The insane complexity of the human mind and our will is so easily overrun by just another person's eyesight. If they can see us, we act differently. Our fear of being judged or of rocking the boat is greater than our adherence to our own beliefs. Have you ever been in a situation like that? where you compromised what you believed in to avoid a confrontation, or maybe you were hoping somebody, el somebody else would deal with this thing. Uh, well, there was a great church leader that did this. Um, he was a wise man. He was second in command to overseeing an enormous congregation. And one day the lead pastor went on a bit of a journey. And with the boss gone, all of a sudden, his morals, his convictions, they went out the window because of a healthy dose of peer pressure. Aaron the Levite could have gone down in history as a great example, but he doesn't. When Moses was gone and all the people around Aaron wanted an idol to worship, he caved so quickly. He knew they were wrong. He knew the facts of who God is and his great power. But that didn't come close to stopping his innate need to fit in. So he organized a giant festival of sin for the entire community to take part in. Uh, did I skip one? Oh. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. I'll let you imagine what exactly was included in that revelry. But this man had seen the power of God, the plagues in Egypt, the pillar of fire and cloud, the parting of the sea, and more. And still he broke to peer pressure so quickly. And he never took ownership of it either. Do not be angry, my lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> when we think we're strong, when we think the evil in the world doesn't affect us, this is what it really looks like. This was a qualified, strong, upright church leader, a man surrounded by believers in a community of faith, and still, the world conforms us so fast. Most of the Old Testament is following the story of Israel conforming to the world. The local religions of Asherah, Baal, 
and even Moloch. Most of these I can kind of understand. I can see the appeal. For Asherah and Baal, their religious practices involved a whole lot of revelry, um, pleasure, and all of that sort of stuff. But Moloch, his thing was child sacrifice. How did that ever catch on? The process of this was so barbaric, I have trouble even describing it. They would make a giant furnace out of bronze in the shape of a big bull, and in the center of the bull was an opening. And in that opening, they'd put live children, live babies, and then to drown out their screaming, they'd play loud music and celebrate. I can't even imagine the kind of evil in someone's mind to give into the world in this way, to abandon such a beautiful gift from God. Yet conforming to the extremes of this world, of this culture, is easy. Our culture is especially skilled at doing something evil, then slowly changing your mind about it until it feels wrong not to support it. It doesn't take evil intention when the natural state of our hearts is already evil. All it takes is a little apathy or a little pressure. Even when we blatantly know the truth. Just like Peter denying Jesus after Jesus is taken before Pilate. Peter was ready to fight to the death for Jesus an hour ago. And now, with Christ out of sight, he crumbles in a moment. The pattern of this world is so deadly. How do we stand a chance against an influence that can make us do these evil, evil things? How can we stand firm when leaders fail? When those that Jesus personally mentored for years crumble to a single question. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our mind is a beautiful thing. It's more than just our way of thinking. Let's define it as our, our intellect, our emotional core, our motives, our desires, our conscience, and as well, our way of thinking. Although it can be quickly influenced for evil, there are many ways to transform it as well. And some of the best ways to transform it are by action. Romans 12.1 starts with offering your bodies, and 12.2 continues with transforming your mind. In the same way, when we do specific actions. When we offer our bodies, we begin to program or transform our minds. We often think of this, uh, that, that to change action, we need to change our mind. And while that's true, it works in both directions. It's a bit of a loop. From, from belief in the truths of God, to concentrated action, to a transformed mind, to more action for good, and so on. Like it really loops and builds on each other. Did you know that even the tiniest physical changes affect our minds and how we feel? There was a study done on mood a while back that just used a pencil. I thought it was so interesting. Um, just hold a pencil between your teeth. Don't let your lips touch it. <laughs> just that. Do that for a few minutes, and you will be measurably happier. And then if you do it where you just hold it with your lips, you kind of force this pout. And that makes you measurably sadder. Our brains are so simple. Holding a pencil in your mouth changes the way you think. This makes you happier. That's crazy. Like, our minds are so simple, yet, be, yet are also so complex. Like, if you're holding a warm drink, you'll generally describe other people in a warmer manner than you normally would. You'll call them more generous and more kind than you normally would. It's, it's that easy sometimes. Like, I guess... Addictions. Addictions are insanely difficult to break out of because your mind has actively been changed into needing that stimulus. But the process is simple. With just 90 days, three months of not consuming or not doing that activity, your brain actually physically changes. You become no longer dependent on that thing. It can still be a battle every day to stand firm under that temptation, but there's no more physical dependency. You know that feeling when you want to want something? You don't really want it, but you really want to want it. For me, that's, that's working out. I used to work out really regularly, and then I, I stopped for a couple weeks, and that turned into a few years, and now it's been quite a long time. Um, 
but I really, really should get back into it. And maybe this will be the motivation to, to push me into it. Who knows? Um, but actions can change our mind here. By doing that activity, you grow the desire for the activity. The desire will slowly fill you. The more you actually do something, the more you want to do that thing. This is the loop we need. We don't want that Romans 124 loop where we do something evil and then God gives us over to those evil things. No, no, no. We want the Romans 12, 2. Oh. We want the Romans 12, 2 loop. The one where we are not conformed but renewed and that renewing gives more action and that action renews our mind and so on. It, it, we have to be careful because we will fall into a loop and we really, really want to be in the right loop. When, when we choose to follow God, even when we don't want to, when all we can muster is, is a wish, that we wish we wanted to do it, if we can turn that into a little action, that little action will begin to transform us. When we give our bodies to sin, it takes our mind with it. But when we give our bodies, when we give ourselves to God, then our mind is taken with it as well. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says this, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. The Spirit will renew your thoughts and actions. When we choose to throw off the sin and the pattern of this world, it lets the Spirit renew us. When you follow God with your behavior, then God often renews the parts of us that we don't know how to change ourselves. Through obedience comes transformation. Romans 12.2 tells us something very special about this transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Some versions say, then you will learn to know God's will for you. So with that renewal, not only is our behavior and mind changed, but we also gain access to the will of God? That's amazing. How often do we wonder what God has for us? How often are we searching for answers, trying to figure out what we're supposed to do? Does this verse say that with the renewing of our mind comes these answers that we seek? We already know a bit about the will of God, and that's good. Let's, let's examine that. Where did we find out a little bit about the will of God? Where did it come from? If renewing our mind leads us to understanding the will of God, then if we can see where we already find God's will, it's probably something that renews our mind. Does that make sense? Does that track? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, great. Um, so we have found the will of God in the Bible. That means that reading the Bible helps renew our minds. We have found the will of God. Um, where, where? Yeah, so you learn more about the will of God from thinking and praying biblically. So thinking and praying biblically helps renew our minds. You learn more about the will of God from seeking counsel from people that read their Bible, that think biblically, that pray biblically. That means that seeking this counsel helps to renew our minds. And these are often the very best ways to find the will of God. Read your Bible. Think biblically. Pray biblically. And seek counsel from people that do this. And then repeat. And then repeat. And then repeat. Often this doesn't lead to the audible voice of God that you're hoping for. Something like, God told me that we should get married. Good luck. Yeah, that, that might not be what happens. Um, people that, that say this are almost definitely sip, skipping some of these steps here. I'm not sure which one, but, but somewhere in there, I think they might have skipped a step. Or have you run into someone that says this? Um, I know this is what I'm supposed to do because I have a peace about it. Have you ever said that? Sorry, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> Find me an example in the Bible of anyone that found out the specific will of God for their life and felt peace. It's not there. Abraham, no, he was not peaceful about that. Moses, no, he tried his hardest to get out of it. He's like, no, send someone else, please, please, please. Gideon, definitely not. He kept trying to come up with more ways to convince God, no, that's not for him. Jonah, same thing. 
there aren't people in the Bible that like the specific will of God for their life. What about Jesus? He tried to get out of it. He's like, please, is there another way? Not even him. From the examples we have, we don't feel peace about God's specific plan for our lives. It's not a comfortable thing. People seeking the will of God, just looking for a nice feeling to confirm what they already want, are definitely skipping steps. Since when have our hearts been truthful? We can't trust ourselves. We can't follow our hearts. That's dangerous. We need to be trained in the gospel. We are too conformed to be relied on. The word of God is the solid rock we need. And when we seek those specific details or that audible voice or a nice feeling to confirm what we already believe, we can get lost. When we skip the steps in the process of read your Bible, think biblically, pray biblically, and seek counsel from those that do that, we lose focus on the will of God that matters most. We need the foundational will of God before we go looking for a special word or, or something unique to us. We have to know the difference between what's biblical and what's not. When we try to use modern ideas as our guide or feelings or special signs, then we can easily be led astray. Our natural instincts are towards evil, not good. The pattern of this world has shaped us and we cannot be trusted. Think about how much time in your life that you have spent being transformed by the active renewal of your mind. Now think about how many hours you've spent being conformed by the pattern of this world. Did you know there's about 14,000 instructional hours at school from kindergarten to grade 12? 14,000. Now, not all of those are being conformed to the pattern of this world, but you're surrounded by people of this world. You're surrounded by people conforming, and it's going to have an effect on you. And what about the media? What about news, movies, TV shows, culture, sports teams? We spend so much time every day being conformed. It's much more than we spend being transformed by the renewal of our minds. The pattern of this world never stops. So we need to be renewing our minds constantly. We need to be in the Bible so much to counteract the pattern of the world. If you are seeking the will of God, don't rely on yourself. Don't rely on your feelings. We need to look for a solid rock to rely on. The word of God. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scripture prepares us for good work and the good work helps transform our mind. Every single day, we need to be diving into this word to transform our minds. We need to be constantly fighting the patterns of this world as they conform us. With the renewal of our minds will come a better understanding of God's will as well as a greater desire for it. But before trying to figure out where God wants you in five years, figure out how to follow his commandments. Oh no, what about this decision that I have to make? What am I supposed to do? Read your Bible. Think biblically. Pray biblically. Seek counsel from people that do this. Repeat. 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 Every single day, do this. Transform yourself through repetition. Exercise these muscles. Don't be a spiritual couch potato. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to transform your desires and renew your mind. Then, when you come to hard decisions, you'll have a path forward. I'm not trying to say that you will mystically know the answer. No, hard decisions are a part of the Christian life. God would not have given us the book of Proverbs if he didn't want us to make hard decisions. He has given us the tools. He's provided us the wisdom we need, and now we need to act. For the Spirit of God, the, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. For the Spirit God gives us, for the Spirit God, I can get this. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Only through him is this possible. Next week, we'll be talking more about specific actions that sacrifice ourselves to him and that renew our minds. We'll also be chatting about how none of this is done on an island. We are a body of believers. And as such, these are actually commands to us in a specifically group 
setting. The letter was written to the, the Church of Romans, and these instructions in this chapter are specifically for us as a group, as a church. But for now, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Father, you are good. Your will for us is good. Thanks for giving us a path out of the patterns of this world. Give us the strength to take action when we can not muster nothing more than to want to want more of you. Show us the areas in our lives where we have conformed to the world. Convict us and guide us away from apathy and into discipline. Be with us this next week, and thank you for continuing to transform us into the image of Christ. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. at UCC at the end, and I'm going to experience these announcements for the first time with you. So let's see what happens. We now no longer stream live, but all of our sermons are posted to our YouTube channel, and I believe they're also on podcast platforms that you would use. 
So you can check those out. Normally they're up by tomorrow. Um, so make sure to catch the stuff that you missed. Thank you for regularly giving. If you're a member here, um, we are a small footprint church without a building and we love helping those in the community. And we often receive requests for money and we're only able to um, assist the people that are in need because of your generosity. So thanks for doing that. If, if you're a member here, please feel free to continue doing that. And I think that's it. So thanks everyone for coming. Have a wonderful day and may the love of the Father, the peace, the fellowship, and the... Amen. Thank you.